Uh, before keynote address, now let me welcome Professor Glenn W. Muscha to talk some few words. Okay. Dr. Muscha is a professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Science at Khalifa University of Science and Technology in Abu Dhabi. He is a research advisor to the Abu Dhabi Department of Community Development and is appointed as the Len Jessup Professor of Leadership and Organizational Change at Watson University, India. Previously, he served appointments on the Law and Society Faculty at Pujo University and the Sociology, Social Justice Studies and Comparative Media Studies Faculties at Miami University. His research focuses on the metaverse, digital inequalities, sustainable development, and the ethical resolution of social problems. On behalf of the department, I welcome you, sir, for today's session on publication strategies for budding researchers in humanities and management. Over to you, sir. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, for this invitation today. Am I audible? Audible, perfect. Okay, all good then. All right, and uh, I'm just I want to verify, please, that you are seeing my uh, my screen, um, my presentation. Yes, sir. We are beginning. Yeah, it's good. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And it is my absolute pleasure to move the slideshow mode. This is not in slideshow mode. Okay. Um, are you seeing my slides as I'm flipping through? No. Okay. So again, you need to go for the presentation mode. Now, seeing seeing slides. No. Presentation. Uh, A screen share option. Press the arrow key. Is it sharing now? Should say 24 tips. Uh, yeah. No, it's coming. Yeah. Then there is an option. Third one. Uh, presentate, present. The second one, second one from the current slide. Second one, second, just, uh, yeah. Yes? Yeah. I click it. Flip next one. Hello, current slide. So can you move to the first one from beginning? Yes, I'm on the first one right now as I'm it's seeing it. Extreme left. Click the left one from beginning. Yes. I think some technical issues. Okay, you, you can move forward. This is okay. Fine. This is okay, huh? Yeah. This one. Yeah, you can, can can see. Okay. <clears throat> well. Uh, so I, I will uh, uh, will proceed and and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I uh, I am uh, Glenn Mushert and as uh, mentioned I'm a professor of sociology and it is absolutely my pleasure to be here today to offer this talk on tips for publication uh, productivity. Uh, before I proceed, I want to uh, offer my thanks um, to. Uh, our chief patron, uh, Professor Mohanan Kunamal, uh, also to the uh, head of uh, the department, uh, Professor Gabriel Simon Tatil, uh, to our organizing secretary, uh, Dr. Biju, 
AV, uh, who uh, is uh, kind enough to to invite me and uh, bring me here today. Also, just want uh, too much, too many people to mention by name, but also the members of the organizing committee, all of the presenters, participants, and let us not forget those people who do uh, things in the background, such as logistics and technical support, and even those people who uh, do our uh, facilities and, and food and transportation and everything to allow us to be here today. It's uh, very uh, much a pleasure. So thank you uh, for having me today. It is it's my honor. Um, now, uh, I am I'm a legacy generation. And as the, the gentlemen who have preceded me have mentioned, um, you know, I am a sociologist, but I also do interdisciplinary work. So ultimately, everything that we do as scholars refers back to some sort of human behavior. Let's always remember that, that there's some sort of humanity on the other, on the other end of whatever, whatever we're studying. And so I'm a legacy generation in that I, I'm at uh, age, if I may disclose, age 53. I'm probably the last generation uh, in, in, the, in the US anyway to grow up without computers. Right. I definitely grew up without uh, having home computers, PCs, that kind of connectivity. Uh, we uh, grew up without the Internet, grew up without email, grew up without uh, smartphones, grew up without social networking. Uh, so we've seen all of these things happen yet. Uh, so my mother, by the way, who is uh, I, I, she will be uh, she, she's over 80. Let's put it that way. And God bless her. She is in, in good health. But she can to this day research, uh, tell stories about receiving their first radio, receiving their first television, which came in black, white format, receiving their first um you know, uh, buying their, the, the stereos of like kind of record players and uh, color TVs and so on. So um, it's interesting that technology has come, digital technology in particular has come to measure everything of human behavior, but it's also become kind of fundamental to how we, how we uh, study things. Okay, so I present this, it's the first time I'm presenting this uh, in, and, and have it, you know, it's a work in progress, uh, but I have tips for publication productivity. Okay, now I have conceptualized this similar to the kind of a Twitter Twitter feed or a Twitter thread where I have the different short uh, statements and the short explanation of each. Um, excuse me, as I got to the end, I didn't have time to make it short. So some of them at the very end may be a little bit longer, but basically I have, um, you know, the point is that research product publication is a crucial, crucial skill for academic productivity. OK, I've worked to learn how to publish successfully. And here is my top 24 suggestions for product uh, productivity and publications. OK, number one, publication is a craft you can learn. So it's any like any professional skill, you can learn how to publish. Um, there are definite practices, attitudes, and strategies that that successfully publishing academicians employ. So uh, the point is, you don't have to have some particular skill or or hidden talent, right? It's that at some point, each of us scholars started with zero publications and started with their first line of of writing an article. OK, and so um, if I can figure it out, you can figure it out, too. Uh, it's it's a lot effort at the very beginning, uh, but it is something that you can learn and become more efficient as you move forward in the process. Right. Remember, if you're an academician, you're talking about a career that might be 40 or 50 years. OK, so how you see things and the skills and the aptitude you have at the at the beginning stage or even in 10 years in or 20 years in will evolve over time, over the life course of a career. Second is that you have to have something to contribute. Right. So let's let's not put let's not like kind of get it backwards, right? That, oh, I want to publish. Well, you know, the point is you have to have something to contribute, something that is worthwhile to, to publish and substance matters. And so 
we don't com we don't publish or communicate our research in a vacuum just to to sort of put it out there right we do so to communicate with the other members of our discipline okay so it's it's important to be knowledgeable about your field and to understand what is a contribution to a field okay so uh attending conferences reading uh recent uh, issues of of uh, disciplinary journals, right, uh, are are all very important in terms of like having something to contribute. Okay, so you have to have something to say, otherwise there's no point in in saying it, right? So then, I I would recommend you define extrinsic success, like outside of you, what does this success look like? So we all work in some sort of context, right? And so most of us work in a discipline at a university, in a department, et cetera, right? So you want, might want to figure out very specifically what it takes to be successful in say an annual review, to be a successful student, to be a successful faculty member, to be a successful research associate, right? So for example, uh, you know, promotion at the university where I work, the Khalifa University in, in UAE, the promotion generally requires an average of two Q1 Scopus listed articles per year over a period of six or eight years, right? So we're talking about, um, this, is, this is sort of like how the, 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 the institution and the dean I work for define success. And also another thing is that you should know the databases that are important for your colleagues, department chair, dean, provost, VC, rector. And so, so you know, are, do, are they looking for, um, are they recognizing uh, publications that are appearing in certain databases? So things such as uh, Scopus, Web of Science, the Australian Business Dean's Council list or Financial Times. And so, you know, as for example, right? And so um, this is it, right? Like, so what does success mean outside of yourself? The second part of defining success is to define intrinsic success. Okay, so um, what does it mean to you internally to be a successful in your uh, as a researcher in publication, right? We hope that this will be a more important indicator of success than the extrinsic measures. You have to be conscious of both, but psychology of motivation uh, clearly indicates that kind of people who have internal motivations to do things uh, are are have superior outcomes so you need to have some sort of um some sort of way of knowing right so i once had a guy uh, who was a dean at purdue university and uh, he said that his goal over his career was to publish five articles that would uh five articles that would outlive him that were making a contribution to his field that would continue to be relevant beyond his beyond his death right that's very specific as a definition, right? And very empowering to take that. Uh, I uh, I actually, um, at when I got promoted to associate professor, I sort of took a time to think about what do I want to do? And I, um, I, I remember I was in a restaurant with my colleagues and I said, you know, my goal is to publish uh, 50, 50 articles uh, by 2030, right? And, and, and they laughed at me because it was like, there was, was like, you know, 2008 or something, you know, so it was like a 25 year or something like that. And, and they kind of laughed and I don't think they were laughing at me. They were laughing because people just don't say that because they sort of like, you know, oftentimes are motivated by the motivated by the extrinsic markers of success less than they're motivated by these intrinsic markers. Okay. And so, you know, how do you define success? And it's perfectly fine to say that, you know, maybe you want to aspire to uh, answer a specific research question, to publish a certain body of work, such as X articles over, over X number of years, or to see, achieve a certain H index or publication uh, citation count or something like that in, in some of the databases. It's all about defining, there's no right or wrong, but the point is you should know for yourself what the intrinsic markers of success are, as well as the extrinsic markers of success of a, of, of a research career. 
Okay. <clears throat> Briefly, it's also important to understand how your field. So we call this uh, field normalization is understand how your field uh, views successful academic publication. Make sure you're comparing apples to apples, as we say, and not apples to oranges, which is something completely different, right? So what looks like a success in uh, econo economics, right, where people tem tend to publish like one article a year and, you know, solo authored and such may not uh, look at all like what is successful in uh, a field such as, say, accounting or finance or sociology or whatever. And so don't make sure that when you're making a comparison or, or viewing things, you're looking at your own your own discipline or your own chosen field okay there's a great difference in like um citation scores h index scores uh the the definition of the co-authors per article right so and i work at a place that has a lot of engineers they might have 47 authors on an article that has like you know that that that's like two pages long right um i don't publish like that and the definition of whose the order of authorship varies in some in some fields being the last author like in medicine is is most important right in others being the the first is more important and so on so understand field normalization six seek accountability and create deadlines okay you have to tell somebody else so seek somebody who will support you and give them this idea that okay, my, here are my overall goals, but then break down your goals into say weekly goals, monthly goals, quarterly goals, annual goals, and, and, and kind of hold each other accountable periodically. So ideally it's, it's one or more colleagues who are, who are doing kind of similar activities as you, but you know, it's something about putting your intentions out into public is uh, not that it has to be public, publicized to everyone, but telling some people who will check whether you're successful or not. This is important because it makes it it makes it more real, right? The other thing I would recommend is create deadlines for yourself, right? So I oftentimes find that that things take as much time as you give them, or you allow them, right? And so you might look for things like a conference where you can say, I want to write a paper before this conference happens six months out, right? And I'll take it there and present it, right? Or maybe there's a submission deadline for, for something like a special issue that you've noticed. Um, maybe it's holidays. Hey, by the time we get to mm, end of June, I'd like to have, you know, two articles submitted, for example, and then I'm going to take a holiday with my family, you know, for whatever, however long, end of semester, whatever. But de deadlines often drive, drive completion, I have found. And so set productivity goals is number seven. So set productivity goals after defining these extrinsic and intrinsic definitions of success, including field normalize right translate these into short-term writing goals things like daily weekly monthly or quarterly so for example a really great goal is to write one hour or say one page per day five days a week leading to 20 pages per month um, if you allow time for reformulization refinement rewriting and editing uh, then you know maybe a, a good uh, it, you know, if you already have data on hand and already have research question to to submit one article in three months uh, could be could be a, a good goal. Right. Uh, or at least to try for that. Right. And you share this with your accountability accountability group. Also, I would put I would say that, like, uh, be consistent writing nearly every day drives success short periods of time consistent short periods of time are superior to writing uh, occasionally for long periods of time so one hour writing per day five days a week will be more productive than five hours writing one day per week this is how the productive mind works okay um in my opinion and my experience and uh, which is verified by many others but 
you know, I, I think consistency is what matters. So to say to block out one hour each day uh, over five days a week is going to be superior in outcome than just sort of saying like I have five hours on a certain day and 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 completely blocking that off. <clears throat> To be successful in research publication also uh, requires a uh, that you build and maintain a robust pipeline. Okay, so anyone that I have ever encountered who is a, a successful and very productive uh, researcher in publication has um, a pipeline. That is, they have a set of articles or other pieces that they're writing that are in in various stages of development from ideation and conceptualization to data collection analysis writing under review under revision accepted forthcoming in press to published right and so ultimately the goal here is the publication but you don't get to publication unless you go through the stages of 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 the development of the piece, right? I consider it like uh, juggling, okay? So like, you know, you only have two hands, but I can juggle more than two balls, say, right? And so how do you do it is that, you know, you, you have to be strategic about which balls you have in your hand at a given time, and then you have to throw them up in the air and, and you know, then let one come down and then free it back up by putting it back another one back in the air and, and, and so on. Right. So many people will have like, you know, five, six, seven, eight articles in, in the pipeline. And I personally have that, that sort of pipeline. Now I started with one, right? Of course, everybody started with the first one. But this is something uh, that is like, you know, kind of to build a pipeline. Um, and to have have these things in various stages and always keep the papers moving forward. If it's in if it's in your hands, you should be moving it forward. Or if it's with collaborators uh, who are doing their part, you consider it moving forward. Or if it's out for review, I consider it moving forward because it's going through this process is working for me. Right. And there's a lot of play times when your project can be working for you or a specific project paper can be working for you, even if it's not in your hands at that at that moment. Uh, something that I've done is uh, uh, conduct frequent high quality peer reviews. OK, especially early in a career, do a lot of peer reviews, say one a month. OK, and so this will help you learn the craft. You will see uh, the the other side of the process. Right. Um, and you will you will hone your own craft. You will improve your own writing when you evaluate the research or the research of others. And in particular, the role of the reviewer is to is to evaluate the paper, uh, communicate to the editor whether this paper is suitable or needs improvement, and then also to offer suggestions of, of improvements, okay? And so there's an excellent template that I have uh, in this, uh, uh, that I put up here, and it's a, it's a peer review checklist, uh, peer review checklist, and I use this uh, frequently. If you, can answer, if you can take a piece of work, whether it's your own or somebody else's, and then you, you follow this checklist, it will give you clarity on like kind of where the paper, what the quality of the paper is or the condition of the paper is, as well as some things that may need improvement. So that's one link. There are many others, but this is just one that I think is, is uh, quite good. Also use uh, available guides like, you know, the, the other point is search out best practices. Ask, ask people next to you, what are your best practices? You know, like sitting there at lunch or a coffee or something, you might ask, hey, what's the what's something that you recently discovered or some practice that you recommend for productivity? And then see what they say. You know, uh, collect your list of best practices and put them to use if they work for you. Right. So, for example, Chicago uh, University of Chicago Press has a, uh, a series of uh, books on uh, guides to writing, editing and publishing some books there. There's many, many type books out there. You can find 
pieces written in, in journals to how to publish an article and, and so on, right? Uh, I think there's a, a, a book that's called Writing Your Journal Article in 12 Weeks by Wendy Belcher. It's part of this University of Chicago series. Um, and she also has, uh, she's a faculty member somewhere in the US, I, I don't know, one of these Ivy League schools, I think it is like Yale or Princeton or something. Um, but she, she also has a useful Facebook group and and you know as i said like setting a goal to in three months to send a uh send an article out for for review um this could be a suitable guide to to accomplish that it takes it, it takes you through all the steps from the beginning to you know writing and then submission uh, another one is like kind of, okay, you have to have some substance. So you have to have some subsystem to capture ideas. So if you've heard of the uh, Nicholas Luhmann, who was the most famous German sociologist of the late 20th century, he wrote over 30 books and nearly 400 scholarly articles. He credited his scholarly success with his what's called a Zettelkasten in German. It stands for like note box or, or like slip box, slip as in like a piece of paper. I wrote it on this slip. Okay, so he had nearly 90,000 note cards uh, and he did it, uh, you know, old school, right? Literally note cards, right? Um, but it's also possible to do this electronically. Uh, if you're looking at a field and you want to master the content in that field, you have to have some way to kind of bring the information in and to process it and be able to re recall it. This settle cost then is something that can be done old school, but nowadays this is also possible to do electronically. Uh, you might search for second brain if you uh, if you're interested. Um, there's kind of a second brain books and websites, and they tell you how to set up these uh, systems electronically. Okay, this can this can help as well. Also, uh, capture flashes, flashes of insight, right? So this, the previous, this settle cost in, or the second brain is about how to like organize like a large body of information. But I'm also saying like capture little flashes of, of insight. It happens, uh, some idea comes on in the mind, right? And then it's, oh yeah, I'll remember that when I get back. Well, no, actually, I find that oftentimes I don't remember. So make some notation to capture. So you can do it on paper. You can send yourself a voice message, a text message, or, you know, uh, so many of the interesting ideas seem to come like when I say out walking the dog or, you know, uh, in the shower, riding the bus, you know, uh, doing the dishes, right? And so have something there that you can just stop, take five, 10 seconds, and then say, here's an idea. Because sometimes those ideas can be, can be very valuable and you risk losing them if you don't have some way to capture them. 14 is uh, use a suitable structure, right? Articles, research articles follow a definite structure. This mode of organization is important in how you communicate. And so make your work conform to the structure expected for your discipline. It's a way of organizing your writing, but also to communicate effectively. Okay. And so it should be something such as the following sequence I list here, something like title, keywords, abstract, introduction, literature review, methods, analysis and findings, discussion, conclusion, references, and notes. Okay, so keep in mind that, you know, the, uh, that you're not writing a novel, you're not writing kind of, you know, there is room for, for, you know, creativity and, and, and making insight, right? But you're using this structure to communicate your ideas because everybody else is expecting your ideas to come in this structure. So you need to use the suitable, the suitable structure, right? Um, okay. I will also say it's always possible to write or it's almost always possible to write. Don't wait until you feel inspired right? Force yourself to the writing table at your appointed time. So if you're saying I'm going to write one hour each day or even 30 minutes each day, five days a week, make sure you get there and you sit down. Inspiration is more likely to hit when you're at your workstation, right? 
um, it's sort of like hmm, the inspiration is more likely to happen when you're there and ready. Okay. Uh, but if not, do some mundane writing work. It doesn't require blazing in, uh, inspiration to write keywords and abstract methods, you know, or to do editing, formatting, you know, it's always possible to write, even if like this inspiration, the, the spark of inspiration doesn't hit. Okay. Um, and so it, if you, if you run into a position where you say, oh, I don't really know what to write, it's possible to, to write. <clears throat> okay. Also, this one is, here's, I'm starting to get longer and longer, right? Because I didn't have time to make this short, but okay. Format, edit, and proofread properly. There literally is no excuse for why we can't do that right you know I, I have my undergraduate students who are like oh do we really have to do this and it's sort of like why would you not do it right would you like your work to come in with spelling mistakes and so on um also make sure that you know you need you need to have perfect spelling grammar and punctuation also perform conform precisely to the journal's formatting requirements okay like so often you you know you get stuff that comes in now uh all scholars should submit perfectly formatted edited and proofread proofread work that said it's okay to use resources to assist you right like grammar checkers spell checkers referencing software originality checks and also professional editing or proofreading right um you know especially if if someone um you know it, English is, isn't strong or whatever language they're writing in isn't strong to get somebody who's a native speaker or highly proficient, right? Uh, but the point is that um, you'd be surprised how many scholars submit kind of stuff that just looks really rough. And I used to complain about my undergraduate students you know, can't they follow directions and things? I no longer do that because I realize that many of my colleagues who should know better do the same kind of uh, kind of rubbish. And and really, when I think about it, like, do you want someone to see your work with your name on it unless it's as good as you can possibly make it? Right. I don't want them to think, oh, this guy's lazy or this this scholar is lazy and they just send it in. Right. It's refreshing when you get something that's perfectly edited, formatted and, and proofread. Right. It, it allows you to ignore all of these details um, to focus in specifically on what the, the, the ideas of the paper are. <clears throat> all right. Now, let's say you have an article and you're ready to submit. Uh, be strategic about where you submit. I often find that many scholars spend a tremendous amount of time uh, working on their articles, yet they, uh, they kind of do a rather quick and arbitrary strategy to find some place to submit. Like they say, oh, I heard about this journal, so let's submit to it, right? Um, what I would do is uh, I would identify the, the, the databases, right? So the Schemago list or Web of Science or the uh, ABDC list, right? And what you do is to go down this list and find the search by discipline, right? So finance versus economics versus, uh, you know, social psychology, whatever it happens to be, right? And, and do like a number of hours of, of research. Follow the links to the journal websites, and specifically look at each journal's like description, what is the scope, what are the requirements. And my goal is generally to locate um, maybe six to 12 journals as targets where I'm going to submit something. And so I have kind of like a general idea, right? And I can prioritize uh, maybe the, the, you know, the strongest journals first and then try for a review and then, and, and then work, work through my list, okay? This is so be strategic and 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 planful, thoughtful about your submission, uh, wh where you're going to submit. Okay, there are a lot of journals out there, there are so many journals, and they're popping up all the time. You will find a journal that's 
that's most appropriate. You want to be an appropriate in an appropriate journal because those people who read it, uh, you want them to care about what you're saying and you want to have that conversation with them. <clears throat> okay, uh, not sure if you, um, not sure if you uh, if this term is necessarily used so much in India, but uh, in American English we use this term "thick skin." It means that you know you kind of are 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 not so emotionally sensitive, and so um, this is about handling rejection and criticism. So when you when you put so much of your person, your blood, sweat, tears, effort into something sometimes people can be sensitive about their work, right? So learn effective ways to manage the emotional consequences of criticism and rejection. These are going to come anyway, right? It's, it's a function of, it's a part of the game, okay? And so one practice that works for me is I, you know, I, I get the response. Of course, I want to see, okay, am I accepted? Do I have a revision or am I rejected or whatever? What do they say? And so I'll usually spend maybe an hour or something and I'll read through, uh, read through the responses. So the editor's uh, response to me and the reviewer's comments. Now, if you're the type of person who gets kind of like aggravated about it, right then it's wise to put it aside maybe put it aside for a week right then come back to it after you have like kind of absorbed the blow and then and then look for anything valid that's in there uh, even the worst review non-constructive review may have some small bits of points the point here is that you want to improve your paper i'll also uh, mention that if you have this robust pipeline that is, if you have, say, like six or eight papers in various stages, you know, you may have two or three of them under review. Well, if one gets rejected, it doesn't kind of hit you as hard. Um, I, I do remember earlier in my career feeling very discouraged when I was re rejected. Um, I no longer have that because it's just sort of like uh, I realize now that the most successful people are rejected more than anybody else. Right. And this is where you may develop a thick skin. OK, so there's resistance to to emotional uh, sensitivity of cr uh, criticism and rejection. Number 19, persistence. Persistence is the key. OK, so the most prolific scholars, as I've mentioned, have been rejected more than anyone else. Right. So the only guaranteed failure, however, is giving up. Right. Ask your friends, uh, ask your friends and, and colleagues to share their share their war stories or, you know, their their, you know, their their adventures of rejection. Right. Eventually, every scholar has a story of submitting an article, like, say, five or ten times over a series of years before it's finally accepted. All right. Um, I have uh, m literally my my first article I ever submitted by myself. This is going back like over 20 years. But the first article I submitted by myself, that is not with an advisor or, or something, you know, and I was like, I followed a strategy I thought was going to be like so successful um, because I found the, the founding editor of, an, of a journal had published an article and I did uh, used his like theory methods and everything to analyze uh, a different case. And I thought, you know, if this guy published his, then this is gonna, you know, how can he not publish this? Well, he just rejected it, you know, came back in a, in a number of hours actually. Uh, and I now understand that's because like I was doing what he had done years ago. Right. So this is not new, you know, and, uh, but anyway, this one article, was the first one I submitted, and I kid you not, it took uh, it took approximately eight years before it was finally accepted, and I lost count of how many times I had submitted it, maybe twelve different times to so many different journals. It ends up being uh, in a Q one Q one journal, a social science journal, and um, and I interestingly one I don't remember if it was the review or the editors, and the time that it was accepted, one of the comments was, "This is a very timely piece." 
right? So, I, well, I had, I had like, I had relegated this one to like, how many times can I possibly get rejected after like revising and resubmitting, you know, all this stuff? How many times can I possibly go through someplace will ev- I hope someplace can eventually publish, publish this piece. And you'll, you know, it, it became actually like a joke to me, right? Because don't expect that you're, that the, the, the sequence of when things get published is the same as when you wrote them. Right. So like I have many publications that hit, uh, you know, had written later that hit earlier, that published earlier, and this one took like you know something like eight eight years or something like that. So, ask people to share these stories because you know, if, unless we talk about these things over coffee at the lunch table or whatever, then you know, it, it's very it's really fun to talk about actually, and it you know kind of communicate so we all go through similar things. Okay. Another thing that I would mention to you is that you don't need to know anyone or have connections to publish. Okay. So some scholars that I have spoken with, especially newer scholars, less experienced scholars, assume that they need a specific credential. They need to work someplace. They need to have, say, like a godfather or some sort of connection. In Arabic, we call that wasta, right? This is going to like connections to achieve publication success. There are some corrupt editors out there who publish their friend's work or they engage in quid pro quo, meaning like you publish mine, I'll publish yours kind of thing, right? Um, but these un, uh, they, they're in these corrupt practices at the risk of their own professional reputation and to the detriment of the overall discipline and scholarly endeavor. There are enough scholars out there who have integrity um, and many times you will get a fair review. I can't guarantee you that you'll get a fair review, but you know, when you have something that seems that's a legitimate journal and you submit it, they shouldn't care if you're a graduate student, if you're an assistant professor, what country you're from, uh, you know, what degrees you have earned. Uh, they shouldn't care about any of this. They should ultimately engage in blind peer review. That is, they send the article to people who don't know who you are and you don't know who they are. And they give their, their, they give their, their best opinion about the work, right? It has nothing to do with who you are, whether you you know, you belong to the mafia, the academic mafia or, or whatever, right? There is those corrupt people out there. I'm telling you, avoid those and you don't need anyone. Because I, I would talk to some students sometimes and, I, and they'd have a paper and they're telling me about it. I'd say, well, I'll send it in and I send it into a journal, submit. And then they say, I can do that. And I said, yes, yes, you know, you can do that. Just, just, just do it, right? Um, there isn't any sort of special, special qualification to, to submit. Okay. Now I've already kind of talked about this, but protect your personal integrity, protect your, uh, you know, and professional integrity, right? Avoid problematic people and problematic practices. If you, if you boil it all down in the most basic, the, the, the primary thing we have of value as scholars is our good name. So for, for heaven's sake, avoid any hint of wrongdoing or corruption, whether it's organizations or people, right? Always maintain the highest ethical standards for your well-being um, because the, what we do is an honorable craft, right? What we do is something that is a, a, a good and honorable way to earn a living and to contribute to knowledge and society you want you know how you who you are speaks very very loudly we don't want to cheapen what we do um, by associating with any unsavory people or or practices so that said uh, i have an advice which is uh, avoid predatory people right so be be suspicious of uh, of any predatory publication practices. So, for example, there are those who go around who offer to, hey, let's co-author papers together. 
meaning like you put your name on mine and I'll put my name on yours and then we end up with two publications. This is a rubbish, this is a rubbish practice. Only partner with people um, who make clear contributions to the papers. Never accept authorship if you cannot identify your contributions to a paper, right? And however attractive it may seem to have somebody with a big name from somewhere who might have like a, a ton of publications and seem influential, I'm telling you, those, those agreements are like what they call deals with the devil, right? So we have this deal with the devil. You sell your soul to the devil, right? You cross that line and you go into this kind of corrupt practice. The, the thing about the deal with the devil, it always costs you more than you get back. There's always the hidden cost, right? So people find out about those who are like kind of in a mafia, sort of academic mafia or who are corrupt and, you know, do this kind of thing. You publish mine, I'll publish yours. You put my name on there. You know, it, we can, you can figure this stuff out right um, and professionals will sort of like kind of draw a fence around around these people you don't want to be associated with them so you will pay more than you benefit and you'll risk your good name okay so avoid predatory people avoid also predatory publications and publishers there are rubbish journals and publishers who don't care about your research or scientific inquiry so be aware of these uh it's better not to have these publications at all because they drag down your cv right uh, some people make a mistake and honestly get put into like a rubbish predatory journal right and it's best to try to get with retract and to remove it from your from your cv uh here's a link it's called think check submit uh this is checklists identify trusted journals and publishers for your research okay um and so in 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 thinking carefully about where to submit also you want to make sure that you have legitimate legitimate journals and publishers where where you're submitting so this caveat emptor means like beware, however, don't assume that open access or publication fees mean a journal or a publisher is predatory. There's a misconception among some that open access means it's rubbish, right? Or that if you have to pay some sort of fee, it's, it's rubbish, right? But I mean, these can be uh, indicators, right? Uh, and another one is like, you know, I've got, I've got this one colleague and he keeps sending me, uh, you know, he gets the, the, the invitation from, you know, the journal of, uh, you know, South Asian humanities, social sciences and something, something, something. Right. And, uh, yes, we're a publication in, uh, Pakistan, you know, and, and it's not affiliated with anybody or any university or any like kind of, you know, and he can sends me these things and he, and he says like, you know, oh, is this legitimate? Should I publish there? You know? And I tell this guy again and again that like, you know, if it's a legitimate journal, they don't pub, they don't contact you and say, you know, send your article into us, right? They don't. They just they just don't. I mean, there are maybe some exceptions where it's a special issue and you're especially relevant and it's coming directly from a colleague, like those kinds of things. But other than that, if you if you receive this, hey, publish here, it, delete, just delete and move on. Okay. And then the last of these is that I just want to tell you, enjoy the game and don't let this imposter syndrome get you, right? The career of a scholar, of a researcher is rewarding. And it's, as I said, it's an honorable way to, to make a living, right? So we all have to make a living. That's a, that's a reality. Um, but there's a, this is a particularly honorable way to do it. I believe in education. I believe in knowledge creation and dissemination and communication. I believe in the, in the uh, service to one's community at various levels, whereas academic community or, or other sorts of community, right? This career should be fun. I hope it gives so much autonomy, uh, of, of what to think about, how to do your schedule, the direction, right? So try to always remember that you're choosing to do this uh, as opposed to something else you might do that could be uh, less rewarding, okay? Um, and at the same time, don't 
fall victim to this imposter syndrome, right? So I have it many times too. Like, does does anybody know that I'm just like you know the uh, you know I was a skinny I was a skinny white kid from Philadelphia, USA, and you know I I didn't I don't really know anything, and I have no real reason why I should occupy this. Well, guess what? Beyond a certain level of intelligence, education, self discipline. It doesn't require any special gift or blessings upon upon the person. It generally requires like this hard work, uh, persistence, and uh, every successful scholar has started somewhere, right? Even we mentioned Albert Einstein. I mean, he he was he started somewhere, right? Um, you can do it too, and you have people around you who are who are doing it as well. And so enjoy the game as much as you can. Don't let the imposter syndrome get you. Whenever you ask, whenever you ask yourself the question, why me? Why should I, why should it be me? The question is like, the answer to that is why not me, right? Like, why not you? Why not you? If you don't do it, I don't see anybody else doing it, right? So you are, you are the one, right? It's on you. You're, you are the one. You can do it too. So I'd like to uh, say thank you uh, at the very end. Um, please connect. Here you have my uh, email, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'd be very happy to have uh, uh, any any of uh, folks uh, connect to me and to engage in in discussions. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, we, can, we can have an interaction section. If you have any questions to ask Professor Glenn, you can move forward and you can ask. I would actually uh, mention that I will share my slides with uh, Dr. Biju. And then, uh, you know, so if you missed any links or anything, uh, I'll, those will come through. I'll, I'll send these slides over via email to Dr. Biju. He can, yeah, he okay, can share it you. with everybody here. Thank you, Professor Glenn. Uh, we have with uh, Professor S. Kevin. He's a popular author uh, in our department and is very popular in India. And uh, he has written many books of uh, security analysis and portfolio management, published by Prentice Hall of India, PHI. So, um, uh, Professor Kevin will interact with you right now. Okay, a pleasure. Okay, Professor Glenn, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So at the outset, uh, let me say that it was a very, very useful presentation. So I think, in fact, I am listening, first time I'm listening to a listed tips for publication. So usually we speak about how to publish, but I'm uh, seeing for the first time a list of 24 different tips. Uh, it was very useful, and those tips, uh, I think it can be divided into two. Some of them are practical tips, and the others are practices, uh, good practices, and bad practices which you should avoid. Mm. So for a publisher, it is extremely useful. Uh, I would say they are very, very practical. They, uh, let me tell you, uh, the most, well, the out of the 24, the one which I liked most was uh, one which I practiced uh, when I was writing my books. I have written a few books and published a book. What I used to do was, uh, I used to set a deadline, as you said. Uh, like, for example, writing a uh, one page per day or uh, five pages per week. Uh, so that, uh, oh, that was what I was doing. It's very practical. Otherwise, you won't move ahead. So mm. similarly, that is one thing which I found was extremely useful, which I was practicing. Similarly, uh, most of the uh, you, uh, tips that you have given are practical. So the researchers who are yeah, uh, who want to write, we can definitely use it. So congratulations for the beautiful presentation. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. I, I would, um, I, you know, this is uh, something that uh, we who are mid-career or, 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 or advanced in our career uh, can offer to our uh, aspiring colleagues. And they say, oh, how do I get from where I am now, some starting point or some point along the journey to uh, the place where I'm going to be sitting in the front and, and referring to having published, 
you know, academic books, multiple academic books. And I think uh, you're right that there isn't some sort of secret formula, right? You don't have like some sort of like message that pops into your brain from, you know, uh, you know, or you know, the, the the real answer is, I sit down every day, and I and I I push this thing forward, and I have done so for, or I you one has done so for many years, and there is that's the magic that's the magic formula is that you know day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and um, that that's it I think. Now, what they exactly to do during that time, we can also give advice advice to that. But this this academic success is not something that just comes about by some sort of like you know gift of magic that happens uh, to you while you're sleeping. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Professor Glenn, I have a question. Yes, sir. So we have many options uh, to write, like papers, uh, books. So as per your opinion, which which of them uh, would create more citation or impact factor? Either is paper or a book. Professor Kevin is there. He uh, has written some books, and I look citations are more uh, in in terms of uh, the books. Mm. And uh, as we compare the books with the papers, books are getting more citations. That's a great question. I would say uh, it has to do with two things. Uh, you know, I talked about the extrinsic motivation and I talked about the intrinsic motivation. So from the point of view of the outside motivations on, you know, what to, what format to publish, whether it's books or versus articles, uh, ask the people in your department, ask your department head or chair, ask the dean, find out what they care about. Uh, ask people in their discipline. Okay, so sociology, where I, where I am, uh, to be successful, one needs to have articles. Right, academic articles in peer-reviewed journals. If you also write some book chapters and you write a book, then that's kind of a bonus. But if you only write sort of a book or book chapters, this is something that uh, might be difficult uh, it, when you go for promotion. Right? Uh, oftentimes, uh, books are something that takes uh, a bit of a, a bigger perspective, a longer time, a little bit more experience in the field, and uh, especially in the article disciplines where where the academic success is um, is measured by articles uh, publishing articles is, is the, often the quickest way to get legitimacy so if you publish say 10 articles then you have interacted successfully with say 10 editors and that would be around 20 30 or so reviewers right and so this is the legitimacy for your uh, for your scholarship is coming by having gone through this process and and successfully with with this group of people um, a book is a little riskier in article uh, disciplines uh, early on i would say because it takes uh, quite a long time to a write the book and b it also takes quite a long time to get like reviews and citations and and things like that for books that said books often tend to last longer have a kind of a longer life than the than than articles in many cases, um, but uh, you know you understand that extrinsic motivation for sure, right? And that in general, in general, I would say articles are are a better investment. Um, oftentimes, there's kind of a the the best practice is where folks have published a number of articles and then they take this is somehow bring them together in in a in a unified book. Right, so where they have given you know a number of related articles and they kind of bring them together. Um, that said, there are other like in history, for example, they publish academic books, right? So in the US, United States, as far as I can uh, you know speak from most of my work experience up until the last you know recent years, if you publish an article, you publish a, a, a book in history on an academic press, then there's your promotion right there. 
right? Uh, they don't publish. They don't publish articles. But for the article disciplines, especially earlier on, I would say this is a better practice for for scholars who want to establish their. Now, once you have a promotion, you have this kind of security, and so you can make up your own decision, right? You know, you you have the. Uh, so I'm a full professor. Uh, and I can decide, do I want to write books and or do I want to write articles? And I don't have to really have that pressure. Um, but it fits, you know, it has to be appropriate to the, uh, the, the extrinsic motivation. And then also has to be, you know, ultimately one's own. If, if, you, if you're not really motivated to write a book, it's quite a long process. And, um, you know, if you're not really motivated, you're not going to do it. It's, it's just, you know, you're going to stop somewhere along, along, along the lines. So, but anyhow, the basic idea is ask those people around you sort of what counts most. Um, and it might be your dean has a specific idea and, uh, and, and so on. Okay, thank you. So any more questions? Anyone to ask? One more question. Uh, I, I have a question again. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the beginners uh, actually they, they will beautifully write papers, but sometimes they may send uh, to some journals, some good journals like A Star or A, so they may get uh, desk rejection. Mm -hmm. But when they when we compare with the papers already published in the same journal, they might experience that their paper is made paper is good but sometimes uh, they have got a rejection. So, uh, so what about your opinion? So because they don't even uh, send for peer review. So in the desk process, they may get rejected. Uh, so uh, I would like to make sure I understand your question exactly. So if you have a really good paper and you send it to a journal, it gets desk rejected. Uh, how are you supposed to think about it when you look at other things that are published in that same journal that don't seem much better or some is it about this exactly well the higher the rank is the journal uh one of the measures of a journal quality is its uh acceptance rate so like highest journals top 10 you know a star financial times 50 I mean, they're going to have acceptance rates of, of like in, in the single digit, you know, like 5% or something like that. And so we know like right away that that so many good papers are submitted to them that get that just get desk rejected. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say I would read too much into it. Uh, I would get it back. Uh, desk rejection to me is actually good because it means that they haven't wasted your time. So desk rejection will come back within, say, a week. Uh, I talked about having this list of list of uh, possible journals. Certainly the top ones would be the Q1 or the A, A star, you know, depending on how you use the rankings. And they're doing me a favor if they say no without taking up months of time, six months to do a review. And so I just like, basically I just get it back and I say, I, I don't know, shake my head, not sure exactly why. And then uh, go to that list and pick the next one, next journal on that list and, and send it in. And I, I just don't, uh, yeah, I, I don't get uh, worried about it. I just, you know, just figure, okay, next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Now, it, it could be that there's some sort of corrupt practice underlying there for the re reason why there's a desk rejection. You know what I mean? But, you know, what am I supposed to do about that? Uh, who knows? Uh, it would be that would be a waste of my time to even even really try to go down that go down that route, because my primary goal is to improve my work and to publish, uh, you know, so. I just disregard that. I, I make a note of it and say, oh, maybe these guys, um, you know, I have certain I have certain experiences, as we all do over times, where it's like, man, I, I submitted a journal 
uh, submitted to this one editor like five different papers, you know, that got published somewhere else quite nicely, right, after getting desk rejected. And so then I, I just shake my head and I say, oh, does this person not like me? Or, you know, is there some, some, something going on? I don't know. But um, that's, but, you know, but there are those, those folks who are, are, you know, more experienced will know there are certain names, there are certain, there are certain journals that might have some, some corrupt uh, practices. So we kind of avoid those. And I, you know, there are enough people who are honorable and, and, and doing things correctly that you eventually will, you, you know, you're, you're, you're more likely than not, I would say to get a fair, fair review and a fair, a fair opportunity. Thank you so much for your answer. So uh, we have seen a beautifully crafted uh, contents, uh, which consists of uh, tips. Uh, I think the, the audience uh, are motivated. So because of uh, if they want to write something, these tips will help them to, you know, uh, to add uh, or help them to, uh, to, to provide some opportunities and uh, uh, help them to get some uh, an understanding of uh, how to write papers and send to journals. So there are a lot of journals, a lot of index, as you said, Web of Science, Corpus, and ABDC. And uh, the people, uh, I, I, as per my understanding, uh, the people are in scratch or sometimes the beginners, they are not guided well so that uh, some predatory publishers, uh, they may uh, utilize uh, the the lack of understanding of the scholars. So that that is what is happening in developing countries. So as far as India is concerned, mm. so the people you know, some people uh, people are more they are looking for predatory publishers rather than good publishers. So uh, it's a pity. Yeah, it's it's truly a pity. And and one thing I have I've seen uh, among uh, scholars in developing countries is that uh, like you have a couple of people who are doing like a good project and they want to get it published. So they will uh, I get offers all the time from folks like would, would I come onto their paper? And I think they're doing it because they believe that I know somebody and I'm going to get help them to get published more easily. And so my response is no, I will not be on a paper unless I make a contribution, right? I, I advise I advise the scholars all the time about like how you might improve your work and those kinds of things. That doesn't mean that I should be an author, right? Uh, so there are those out there who, who will say, jump on there and say, great. And at the type of deal with the devil I mentioned, you know, they may have a famous name and they may publish 30 articles a year or, you know, recently we had one guy who applied for a job in, in, a, in a science field at my university and the guy had published like, you know, 300 articles in two years. Well, everybody knows this is it, literally impossible. And so, you know, while there's some level of like administrators are saying, oh, yeah, this guy has a great H index and citations and stuff. I'm saying this guy can't possibly, you know, look, OK, so if you're the chief of NASA and you have 100 Ph.D. students working for you, then, yeah, maybe you can publish 200 articles in a year. Right. But aside from that, our normal people. You know, you publish. Uh, you know, you publish a reasonable number of articles. Like I said, for for the university where I work, two Q1 articles a year is is a, a, a very good average of that, right? So after six years, you have 10, 12, 14 articles at, that are nicely placed. That's what that's what is reasonable, right? Yeah. Um, no, we can see. Uh, so in India, we can see people. In academics, they have more than 100 papers and all the papers in predatory journals. So that's the status right now. Uh, so people are going towards the predatory journals rather than the good journals and because they don't have patience. They don't have uh, uh, the time to wait or something like uh, time for quality writing. So look for the predatory journals before they get the academic uh, 
promotions and all placement and all yeah there's a certain level of it can be driven by like kind of the need to have publications so that you get uh the need to get publications to get promoted or 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 something like that and you know in in some countries also like say france for example they actually um you know give like cash payouts the cash rewards to people for for publishing I, i think this is completely wrong um as a way to you know uh if you want to make an incentive say the dean wants to make an incentive then give the person like some professional funds that they can they can spend such as like hey uh, how about like taking a conference you know or buying a software a new laptop you know those kinds of things that must be spent on the you know the the, the endeavor itself and not on you know hey just like say 500 us if you publish in a a star journal right i mean i don't think that's uh, that's right at all. Now, these people will always find a job somewhere, such as, uh, you know, there will be some like kind of cynical deans who want to hire people just because they have 100 articles, even if they're, you know, but um, but, but there's there's enough of us that have gone through the right way and that believe in, you know, what we're, what we're doing is, 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 I mean, it's it's a it's a bit more important than just the job. Right. So, you know, the 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 sirs who spoke before me uh, very passionately were telling us about, you know, the, the, the future of humanity and our our small part that we might play in 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 that in that role. And to remember that the bag of rice, each grain of rice, you know, as they say, like on every grain of rice is written the name of the person who will eat it. But it also say like you know that it's also written the whole story of of the millions of people involved in the supply chain and you know the humanity of it of it all. And I guess I just sort of like let's not let's not forget that that you know. And I I think it's a pity those people who are predatory and who manipulate the system should be pitied, um, uh, pitied for their their you know. Uh, dragging down the, the 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 important nature of what of what we do at heart um, which is educating and knowledge creation and communication but also they should be pity, pitied for finding it satisfying to do to, to, to manipulate some some system that that's really like time honored uh, over centuries and many uh, cultural perspectives this idea of teacher and student of, of, of learning and communicating there's more to it than that and if you if you're careful if you're careful you know as they say in America they say if it's too good to be true then it probably is meaning you know we've all people have get scammed when they expect something to happen money for nothing or something like that right so hey some some big name comes you guys got a hundred publications why don't you publish with me why why would he want you right why does he want why does he want you graduate student assistant professor he wants you because he wants to use you he doesn't want you because he wants to you know lift you up and contribute so be wary be careful um sometimes we'll make mistakes but i think we'll you know, there's enough of us who are who are in the right direction and, and of the right mindset. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, having found uh, time to interact with us. So on behalf of the department, and we have a lot of questions to ask, but the lab paucity of time, the next section, uh, we are running short of time. So on behalf of the department, on, on behalf of the University of Kerala, so I extend my sincere thanks uh, and gratitude to Professor Glenn uh, for the wonderful session delivered, the wonderfully crafted uh, points and tips uh, for making effective publications. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you all and best wishes for your uh, four days ahead. A very productive time. Best wishes. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you. So now we can have a tea break uh, and after that, the session will be continue.